Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar sponsored by CAMRA's Partnership of Christians and Jews. I am Tricia Miller, one of two Christian research analysts at CAMRA, the Committee for Accuracy in Middle East Reporting and Analysis. It is my great honor today to welcome Reverend Malcolm Hedding, who will speak today on the subject, Israel and Apartheid. Malcolm is an ordained minister with the Assemblies of God of Southern Africa. He entered the ministry in 1975 and in the 1980s became an outspoken critic of the South African apartheid regime. His activism did not make him popular with the powers that be, and he eventually had to leave the country with his family, and so they moved to Israel. The combination of his experience in South Africa during apartheid and his subsequent life in Israel means that there is no one more qualified to expose the truth concerning Israel and apartheid. In addition to taking a stand against apartheid, Malcolm has boldly proclaimed the truth concerning God's heart for the Jewish people and the nation of Israel throughout his more than 45 years of ministry career. He is an astute theologian. He has a profound ability to teach, and he's one of today's most articulate speakers on the scriptural basis for Christian support of Israel and the Jewish people worldwide. He has traveled extensively preaching and teaching in churches around the world, and as a result is an internationally recognized speaker on Israel and the church, and he's a leading theologian in the Christian Zionist world. From 2000 to 2011, Malcolm served as the executive director of the International Christian Embassy in Jerusalem, and before and ever since, he has continued to be involved in the work of the embassy. He's also the co-founder of the Christian Desk at Yad Vashem, which is a joint project established by the Christian Embassy and Yad Vashem for the purpose of teaching Christians about the Holocaust and their responsibility to stand with the Jewish state. Malcolm has written almost 20 books, including a series on biblical Christian Zionism that has been translated into multiple languages. After serving on the pastoral staff of a large church in Murfreesboro, Tennessee in recent years, Malcolm and his wife Cheryl have now moved back to Jerusalem to establish a ministry center where among other things, they will continue to teach Christians about the biblical significance of Israel. They will continue to resist anti-Semitism and anti-Israelism. They'll write more books and they will be helping the persecuted church in the Middle East. After Malcolm speaks, there will be time for questions. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please type it into the box that appears when you click on the Q&A icon. And so now I turn it over to you, Malcolm. We are very much looking forward to what you have to impart to us today. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Miller. And uh, it's, a, it's a great blessing and a great joy to see you again and to work with you. And uh, I thank God for camera and for the wonderful um, work that you do on behalf of Israel, the church, and its relationship to the Jewish people. Thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this event today. It's a real joy and a real privilege. We're going to look today at the question of, is Israel an apartheid state? And before we dive into uh, the content of our discussion today, I'd like to just read one passage from the Hebrew scriptures located in Numbers 23, verses 7 to 9. And we read the following. Balak, the king of Moab, has brought me from Aram, from the mountains of the east. Come, curse Jacob for me, and come, denounce Israel. How shall I curse whom God has not cursed? And how shall I denounce whom the Lord has not denounced. For from the tops of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him. There, a people dwelling alone, not reckoning itself among the nations. Remarkable scripture, unearthing the fact that thousands of years ago, there were people who desired uh, to curse the Jewish people and to somehow do away with them and remove them from the earth. And yet there is no people that has blessed the world more than this people. Their contribution to the world has been absolutely remarkable. And that's just to understate the truth 
concerning the contribution that Israel and the Jewish people have made to the nations. For Christians, we have our wonderful Messiah, the Lord Jesus. What a wonderful gift they've given to the world. And of course, there have been so many Nobel Prize winners that have come out of the Jewish world. And in proportion to their numbers, they overwhelmingly dominate the Nobel Prize indicator. And that is amazing. And we could go on and on uh, listing the remarkable achievements of the Jewish people and, of course, the state of Israel. Today, we can think of Elon Musk, a remarkable Jewish man who has uh, entered into the world of space travel. What about Albert Einstein and many others who've made remarkable contributions to the world? But sadly, they are hated. And this has been their testimony through the nations. There's this thing because of their difference that this particular passage of scripture highlights that people somehow are overtaken by the disease of anti-Semitism and have laid all sorts of charges against this people through history. And uh, it is such a sad thing. But nevertheless, we find uh, that the God of Israel says he will never curse them. He will never, ever do anything to remove them because their calling has been remarkable. They have stood alone for the sake of each and every one of us on this webinar today. So let's turn to our subject, the apartheid slur against the state of Israel. Today, my friends, it is popular and politically correct to accuse Israel of being an apartheid state. This smear has been brought against the only democracy in the Middle East by the BDS movement, that is boycott, sanction, and divest from Israel, and by pro-Palestinian activists who in reality have no interest in democratic government and real peace with Israel. The implications of this accusation are serious in that if the original apartheid state, South Africa, had to be overthrown and dismantled as it was, then it stands to reason that the same must happen to Israel. That is the foundational basis upon which this smear that Israel is an apartheid state exists. Of course, this initiative to brand Israel a racist state is not a new one, as a similar attempt was made in 1975 at the United Nations when the General Assembly adopted a resolution defining Zionism as racism. After close scrutiny and investigation, this resolution was finally overturned in 1991, when it was established that, in fact, Zionism is nothing more than an ideology that gives expression to the longing of Jews everywhere to return to the land of their forefathers. However, notwithstanding this setback, the enemies of Israel were determined to remodel the accusation. And they did this in the form of the current charge of Israel being an apartheid state. So then, the apartheid slur against the state of Israel is just another attempt to reintroduce the notion that Israel is a racist entity that must be dismantled in order to bring peace to the Middle East. Those who advocate for this position are invariably Islamists who wish to see Israel given over to the totalitarianism of radical 
Islam. That is, they would be more than happy to see Hamas or Hezbollah in control of the region. In fact, at the very root of this movement is the age-old problem of anti-Semitism. My credentials. Why would I speak to you about this today? I am a South African who was born in 1952 and was therefore raised in the apartheid state of South Africa. I saw the wickedness of this system firsthand. I lived in its world every single day and witnessed the systematic dehumanization of 30 million black people by a white minority government of only 2 million people. I also, as an ordained minister of the Assemblies of God of Southern Africa, preached against the system from a biblical perspective that asserts that all men are equal and created in the image of God. I wish to affirm at the very outset then today, therefore, that there is nothing in Israel that is even close to this abomination and to suggest that it is, is an insult to the millions of black people in South Africa who lived and suffered under apartheid. The truth is nowhere in Israel today are Arab Israelis treated in the manner in which the black people of South Africa were treated. Arab Israelis can go anywhere in the country, live anywhere they wish to, attend any university or educational institution or hospital of their choice, and they can take up any profession they desire. Is there discrimination in Israel? That's a good question. Is there discrimination in Israel? Of course there is. Just as there is discrimination in every state. But this does not mean that Israel or any other state are guilty of apartheid. If this were true, then even the United States of America would have to be designated an apartheid state, given its history of segregation and discrimination, that it is still struggling to emerge from. So let's look at the apartheid state, at what it actually looked like. The apartheid state of South Africa, by contrast, passed laws that totally stripped the African people of having any stake in the land of their birth. These laws were draconian, inhumane, and vicious. And they were the following. The Group Areas Act that placed restrictions on where blacks could live and disenfranchise them from voting in the land of their birth. The Influx Control Act that limited the movement of blacks in the country. The Job Reservation Act, which prohibited black people from taking up certain professions. The Bantu Education Act, which provided black children with an inferior education to that which white children received. The Bantu Stan Act, which herded black people into tribal regions of the country, which had no possibility of being economically viable or legitimate. The Mixed Marriage Prohibitation Act, which barred South Africans from marrying across the color line. And finally, the infamous Pass Laws Act, which temporarily legalized 
black people's presence in certain regions where they served as housekeepers, laborers, and gardeners for the white community. More to the point, the latter meant that black people could not freely move around the country unless they were able to provide labor or some type of work for white owned industry, etc. The pass, or what was called the dorm pass, or the stupid pass, as the back black people refer to it, legitimized their presence in a place that they would otherwise not be allowed to live in or operate in. The dorm pass, as it was therefore called, tightened up the restrictions outlined in the Influx Control Act. Black people were thus herded into locations, afterwards called townships, like Soweto, from where they served as cheap labor to the big white by night cities and industries. If caught out of their zone as designated by their pass, they were immediately arrested and thrown into jail. Indeed, if they were legitimately in the area, but forgot to carry their pass, they were still arrested and imprisoned. Their pass governed their lives, designating their place of domicile and had to be upon their persons at all times. I'd like to speak about resistance then. In March 1960, anger and resentment in this regard boiled over and consequently some 5,000 black people embarked on a peaceful protest at a police station in a place called Sharpville. The response by the apartheid apparatus was swift and severe in that 69 people were gunned down and killed and a further 180 were wounded. According to the governing authorities, the blacks would be taught a lesson. Resistance would be met, quote unquote, with an iron fist, as one Nationalist Party leader put it. According to the white minority government, Africans actually had inferior brains to whites, and therefore they did not need to qualify for white education. No, they were instead subjected to what was called Bantu education. And to make matters worse, the nationalist Afrikaner government insisted that the language of education in black schools be that of Afrikaans. Black children could not be schooled in their own mother tongue, but in that of the oppressor. The response led to what was called the 1976 Soweto riots, which broke out and swept through the whole of the country. The government in turn, once again, responded swiftly and with brutality and they indiscriminately shot countless of thousands of black people others were arrested and put into jails anti-apartheid activists like steve biko were murdered and others like nelson mandela were imprisoned on robin island just off the beautiful city of cape town Indeed, the Soweto riot sparked the very end of apartheid, as from that time forward, the only way the government could keep a lid on the resistance was to encircle African townships or locations with what was called a ring of steel. That is, tanks, armored cars, and other armed soldiers 
encircled the black townships and brought to the white only areas a sense of false peace and security. The country was boiling. Underneath the vast black majority lay disinvested, dehumanized, and totally disenfranchised. The truth is, in apartheid South Africa, black lives were cheap and expendable, and many young desperate black people were hung for petty crimes like theft. Black lives did not matter. The stark reality of all of this was the following. The living conditions of black people were appalling, to say the least, as the sprawling black townships had little or no services. In the winter months, a thick pall of gray smoke hung over these areas, bringing with it all sorts of sickness and respiratory diseases. The, myth, the misery, my friends, of being born in black South Africa was indescribable. And it was on the backs of their labor that the country was built and thrived. So the South African government marginalized its black citizens and herded them into Gestapo like ghettos. So then, having given you this picture of apartheid South Africa, And words cannot fully describe the horror of what I've just told you. But having given you this picture, to equate all of this with the nation state of Israel today is simply absurd and outrageous. Arab Israelis excel in all areas of Israel's economy. They have full representation in the Knesset. And in fact, at present, as Israel struggles to form a government, they may be the kingmakers. They occupy positions on the High Court of Israel and officially represent Israel at international beauty and singing contests. There is precisely nothing that holds them back from achieving their dreams in the free and democratic state of Israel. Most of all, the constitution of Israel guarantees them equality before the law. And the high court of Israel has time and time again ruled in their favor. This is no apartheid state, my friend. And the smear in that regard is absurd. And as I said, to equate this with what I personally witnessed and saw in terms of the dehumanization of 30 million people, to equate this with Israel is nonsense. So what's the real issue? To be honest, then, the real 
slur leveled at Israel as being an apartheid state is made against the nation in the context of its conflict with the Palestinians on the West Bank and Gaza. In other words, this accusation is made within the framework of disputed territories only. However, those who make it have sinister and wicked motives in that what they really desire to use this accusation as is one of their weapons that they can wield in their desire to fully dismantle the Jewish state. They affirm this time and time again in the Arabic speaking media. And that's important. They say different things in English for the world. But in the Arabic speaking media, they constantly affirm that they are fully committed to the total dismantling of the state of Israel. And of course, the founding charters of the PLO or the Palestinian Authority and Hamas continued to call for the total liquidation of the Jewish state. They have no desire to come to a settled and peaceful accommodation with the state of Israel, even though, and this is important, even though successive Israeli governments have endeavored to do so. The idea of two states living side by side in peace and security is not on their agenda. And they say it all the time in Arabic. They wish, my dear friends, to reclaim the lands once under the heel of Islam. And this in turn means that the very existence of Israel is anathema to them. Bibi Netanyahu recently said the following, and he was right, quote, why do Palestinians continue to fight Israel? What really angers them? I said it at the APAC conference in 1988, and I will say it again. It is not that the Palestinians lack a state, but that the Jews have one. That's the issue. So that brings us to what we call the war on two fronts. To achieve the goal of Israel's destruction, they wage war on two fronts. A war of terror against Israel, and they wage a diplomatic war against Israel in the halls of international institutions and on the college campuses of the West. The latter has taken the form of branding Israel an apartheid state. As we have now witnessed again from the latest statement put out by Human Rights Watch. Those who use it and advance this narrative all over the world actually know nothing of apartheid and would not even be able to properly define it if asked to. I have debated people all over the world. And I've asked them, who were the people involved? What were their names? What was grand apartheid? What were the various acts that governed it? How was it applied? Invariably, 
almost 100% of the time, they know nothing. However, the word apartheid is a very emotive one. And thus we can only oppose it with the truth. I know the truth because I grew up in apartheid South Africa and lived in the free democratic state of Israel for 14 years. If one listens to the nightly television broadcasts of Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, as Palestinian Media Watch or Memory do, one will quickly learn of their ultimate agenda, that of Israel's destruction. I'm not exaggerating. But few people do, you see. And these particular organizations, Palestinian Media Watch and Memory, they make no comment. They simply record what is said every day in these media positions. And there's one thing that is clear. This has nothing to do with a two-state solution or anything like that. It has everything to do, my friends, with the dismantling of the state of Israel. Sadly, Western politicians routinely laugh this off as mere rhetoric, just as they did some 75 years ago when Hitler and his thugs said the same things. The Oslo Accords. The Oslo Accords in the 1990s, by which Israel was prepared to make major and painful concessions, nearly brought this unhappy episode to a conclusion. But at the very end of this initiative, Yasser Arafat withdrew falsified reasons for doing so and began a war with Israel, now known as the Second Intifada. Some years later, after his death, his wife, who lives in Paris, Sucha Arafat, later confirmed that he withdrew from the Oslo peace agreements because he was not prepared to give what he called, quote unquote, the Islamic inheritance of his people to the Jews, meaning that he could not adhere to the peace accords he had to, that he had agreed to, as these only gave the Palestinians a portion of land and not all of Israel. In fact, after the presidential inauguration of Nelson Mandela at Pretoria in April 1994, Arafat, speaking in a mosque in Johannesburg, and this is on record, confirmed that his peace agreement with Israel signed on the lawns of the White House with Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin and President Bill Clinton in 1993 was nothing more than a deception designed to buy time in order to pursue the greater goal of Israel's total 
destruction. Now, my friends, Israel is not an apartheid state in any shape or form. Her restrictions on Palestinians in the disputed territories are designed for only one purpose, and this includes the security war to stop Palestinian terror squads from assaulting her towns and her villages. In this regard, they have been successful. And any democracy under sustained assault would do exactly the same. In fact, Israel is a bright light in the Middle East of civilized democratic government. And recently, Arab journalists in Egypt and elsewhere in the region have acknowledged this. For sure, even the so-called Arab nations in the region, like Saudi Arabia and Jordan, remain dictatorships with restrictions and laws that sometimes shadow the apartheid state. Women live under severe restrictions. Their testimony in a court of law is not equal to that of a man. They are in some insta instances banned from driving cars and even barred from occupying certain professions. Add to this the fact that the press is not truly free and must tow the government line, that people of other faiths cannot practice their religion freely, and that Muslims who convert to another religion are executed publicly, then the picture you have is of another version of apartheid. Who can deny it? Transformation and hope. South Africa underwent a remarkable change in that the apartheid government realized that it could not continue to rule the black majority in a manner that robbed them of their human dignity. It therefore decided to genuinely sue for peace and this required the very bold and courageous step of surrendering power to a black majority democratic government. President F.W. de Klerk found a genuine peace partner in Nelson Mandela, and together they forged a new day for all of South Africa's people. The only apartheid state collapsed, and as they say, the rest is history. Sadly, and I mean that, sadly, Israel has yet to find a genuine peace partner who does not have her total destruction in mind. Until such a person comes forward, she will have to be vigilant and watchful while at the same time continuing to strengthen her democratic institutions, which are indeed the envy of the whole region. Indeed, the present peace initiative with the United Arab Emirate, Bahrain, Morocco, and possibly Sudan, Algeria, and even Saudi Arabia is an indication that a new day is coming wherein Arabs and Jews can live side by side in peace and prosper enormously because of it. The old paradigm of perpetual hatred can be overcome and defeated. Golda Meir, the Prime Minister of Israel, once said, quote, Until the Palestinians love their children more than they hate the Jews, there will be no peace in the region. She was right. And sadly, it seems that more lives will be lost just as long 
as the Palestinians and their sponsors from Iran and elsewhere continue to wage war against Israel. They will fail, as will the BDS movement and the Israel apartheid movement, because the truth will always overcome the darkness of lies and deceit. Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority, is an example of this type of wickedness because he continues to assert in the light of overwhelming evidence to the contrary that the Holocaust never happened. That is astonishing. But that's what he does. It is impossible to negotiate with a man like this who is intellectually dishonest and incapable of telling the truth. It is no wonder that he and his fellow travelers continue to peddle the lie that Israel is an apartheid state. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Reverend Malcolm Heading. That was profound. Um, you, in addition to um, a predominantly Christian audience uh, listening to this today, there are several members of camera staff, including our executive director, Andrea Levin. And I just want to personally thank my colleagues at camera for being a part of this Christian, what was, you know, basically a Christian um, webinar. But thank you so much for being here. And Malcolm, I know that as I am, that they are um, totally encouraged uh, and strengthened by this profound proclamation of the truth. You covered so many issues in such a succinct way, but you covered so many issues that camera deals with day after day after year after year. And so um, I'm personally blessed to hear someone so articulately, articulately cover so many of those issues. And I just thank you for your, um, your profound presentation. Thank you. You mentioned uh, the Human Rights Watch report that just came out this week and, and uh, a number of people at camera have been dealing with it this week. And I wanna to get to a, a question um, on that in a minute, but, but just in response to some of the things you said, um, contrasting apartheid with how uh, Arabs are treated, not only are, not only is more than 20% of Israel's population non-Jewish, even though Israel was established to be a Jewish state, but the way that the, the, the Israelis treat the Palestinians who they legally, um, they have to manage this land that came into their possession because of the wars. Um, uh, but one of the, one of the false charges um, against Israel in this Human Rights Watch report that I, would, I just want to cover first has to do with the law of return. And in this report, Human Rights Watch claims that Israel's laws give preference to Jews, as if that's a bad thing. But Israel was established to be a Jewish state. So obviously we should expect that in the world's only Jewish state. The Human Rights Watch twists that and says these are anti-Palestinian laws. Well, this is absurd because no non-Jew can receive automatic citizenship. I can't decide I wanna to move to Israel and become a citizen. And I don't feel persecuted against, it's, it's there to be a Jewish state. Um, so this, this law does not target Palestinians. There's nothing anti-Palestinian in this law. Every nation has the right to determine who's eligible for citizenship. And many other countries have laws that allow people with their particular ancestry to return so Israel's law of return is not peculiar to Israel, and it's not racist. However, back to the subject of your presentation, Israel's the only country that's accused of being apartheid for having this law of return. Many other countries have this.
But this is particularly significant, and you highlighted so well the poor conditions for Palestinians, for women, for minorities who live under Arab rule, et cetera, et cetera. You went into that. I just wanted to add to that, that this is particularly significant in light of the fact that every Arab country has laws that prevent Palestinians from becoming citizens. So they want, the Arabs won't even accept the Palestinians as citizens. And yet, as you pointed out, Arabs can be citizens in Israel. They have the same rights and privileges and opportunities. So I just wanted to add that in that this entire thesis of this report revolves around this charge that they're discriminating, that Israel's discriminating against Palestinians. And the underlying belief is that it's, it's not moral or necessary for Jews to have their own state. So that what they're actually against is a Jewish state. They're actually against the Jewish people. So this is, this is anti-Semitism, just pure, pure out. So um, can you, do you wanna go into more about this um, Human Rights Watch report? It's human for the benefit of people listening. Human Rights Watch is a notoriously anti-Israel organization. <laughs> They've been anti-Israel for years and years. And they really, really try in this over 200 page report to make it sound like Israel's uh, apartheid state. But they distort the, the true meaning of apartheid. They misrepresent Israel's actions. So would you, would you like to comment more on this? Yeah, I would, I would say, first of all, um, it was the law of return that, that um, after they had successfully negotiated with Arafat to create a second state, so that there, there would be two states living side by side, Arafat, in order to get out of the protocols that he signed and agreed to, uh, did exactly what you've said. He demanded the law of return of Palestinians, but he demanded that Palestinians not return to the newly formed Palestinian state that they had in mind, but to the state of Israel. By this time, the United Nations Agency for Refugees in the Middle East had designated generations of Palestinians and their children numbering in the millions so that if Israel gave in to a, a decision like that, the actual fact was that the state of Israel would have been totally overwhelmed by Palestinians. And the nation of Israel was set up in the shadow of the Holocaust. There was nothing racist or anything sinister in that. In fact, it was an act of grace and compassion for a people who for centuries lived amongst the Gentiles and experienced nothing but murder and mayhem, killing and exiles and gassing, culminating in the awful truth of the Holocaust. And uh, so to assert that in some way to have a homeland for the Jewish people is racist, is totally ridiculous. It's outrageous. Mm -hmm. And it must always be seen in the backdrop of the manner in which these very nations that support this nonsense treated the Jewish people for centuries within their borders and, uh, and persecuted them and killed them and burned them and gassed them and shot them <clears throat> and murdered them mm -hmm. at will. And as Jabotinsky said before the Second World War, when he went through Europe, he was a prophet to his own people. And he had that famous statement, particularly to the German Jews, liquidate yourselves from Europe or Europe will liquidate you. That's right. And that's exactly what happened. Right. So the establishment of a homeland for the Jewish people was a survival mechanism. There was nothing racist in it. And, and Arafat, if he wanted a true and honest law of return, once they signed that agreement under Oslo, with Yitzhak Rabin and Bill Clinton, that law of return should have been to the newly formed Palestinian state. But again, he knew that if you could stall the whole system and dupe Israel into fulfilling another law of return, it would overwhelm the Jewish state, dismantle it, and finish it. And in the end, his own wife told the truth mm -hmm. when she said he had no intention of following through with the Oslo in courts because, as he put it, he could not give the Islamic inheritance of the people to the Jews. 
And that's the bottom line here. There's nothing here to do with apartheid or with some type of sinister racist initiative. That's As right. for this um, new report that has come out, um, we know that uh, one of the authors is uh, Omar Shikar, Shakir. He has a history in Israel of, of being an activist, of, <laughs> of misreporting the truth. He was a so-called journalist. He has a big chip on his shoulder. Uh, eventually, Israel had to pull his press credentials because of the, the lies he spoke about and the untruths he was propagating. And uh, this is a long history of an organization that has lost its credibility a long time ago. And even its founder, a certain Mr. Robert Bernstein has come out against it. And uh, so, you know, we have to take it from whence it comes within its context. It is another attempt uh, to ride on the coattails of the recent decision of the International Court to prosecute Israel as an apartheid state. So this thing came out in a very timely way in order to augment that charge and to follow through on this whole platform of uh, BDS, and of course, ultimately, uh, to dismantle the Jewish state. Yes, I agree. The timing of this and the International Criminal Court, it's obviously, I mean, they are, they are uh, colleagues, they are collaborator, fellow collaborators. Um, for those of you listening, the International Criminal Court has decided to prosecute Israel for, quote, unquote, war crimes such as the military action that they had to take against Gaza in 2014, yeah. when, you know, the day after day, week after week, year after year, they, the Israelis living in Southern Israel are bombed. There's missiles coming from Gaza. Finally, is Israel reluctantly finally takes action. They very carefully target the, the sites where the missiles are coming from. They take every precaution possible to not injure civilians. They warn ahead of time of attacks. What kind of army warns ahead, you know, warns the enemy when, when they're going to attack? But Israel does so that civilians can get out of the way. Um, I, wanted, I wanted to ask you something else because the 20th, and I wanted to talk about something else here because the 20th anniversary of the UN World Conference Against Racism that was held in Durban is coming up this September. Well, we know this original conference was blatantly anti-Semitic. And Human Rights Watch uh, was enthusiastically involved in that conference, as they are with the International Court that you just mentioned. Um, so at, at that conference, originally, they, they distributed the protocols of the Elders of Zion. They had anti-Semitic flyers supporting Hitler. They had banners supporting terrorism against Israel. What do you expect? What, what's going to happen with this anniversary coming up? Well, I think it'll be more of the same. I was in Durban at the time, by the way, mm -hmm. and uh, we launched a whole campaign against them outside. And uh, we were gratified to see that most Western nations walked out of that conference, including the USA mm -hmm. and many others, because they saw exactly uh, what was happening here. And again, this is another attempt to dismantle the Jewish state by having a conference in South Africa, which was the apartheid state, what a what a gift to get onto the stage there mm -hmm. and, and 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 to say, well, now that this apartheid state has been dismantled, let's deal with the second one in the world. So the the whole thing was a setup, and uh, you know these people these people have delegitimized themselves time and time again. And you know the, the big problem or the elephant in the room that's never talked about, and sadly even. Uh, in many spheres that we move in uh, is the fact that underneath it all is the Islamic theological agenda to dismantle the Jewish state. I mean, come on, Hezbollah, it actually means the army of Allah. Sorry. Hamas means the, uh, the, the so jihad, Islamic jihad. It comes out of that type of thing. The popular front for the liberation of Palestine. If you look at their material, as most people don't, but I do, you will see that it's heavily laden with Islamic radical theological thinking. And no one wants to deal with this thing. You see, it's not politically correct to bring it up because uh, you shouldn't do that. But this is the elephant in the room that, that, that this is an attempt to, to, to return the, the land of Israel, all of it, to the Dar al Salam, the house of peace of Islam. And, uh, and the fact that a, a Jewish entity took root in the very heart of Islam 
is a contradiction of their theology, of their thinking, and of their religion. And uh, they have to dismantle it. This is a theological problem at its root, but no one wants to talk about that, do they? But the names of these groups that are arrayed against Israel and their, their language in Arabic every single night is just peppered with the radical Islam jihadist mm -hmm. theology. Mm -hmm. And until we start telling the truth, we were, I was once in the European Union at a conference on Israel and, uh, and all of this stuff and every speaker got up and, and talked about it. And I got up actually and I said to them, you know, I'm surprised at all of you. These are members of parliament, everything. And I said, this, this conflict is a theological one and not one of you had the courage to mention it. Mm -hmm. Not one of you. So you never told the truth to anyone. And that's what's going on here. So we have to, we have to know as, as a Christian, and I'm sure many of our Jewish uh, listeners as well, that the God who brought back the nation of Israel to the land of Israel, just as it was in numbers in the Torah, when they first came back, he's going to look after them. Mm -hmm. And these things will not succeed because if you want to remove Israel from where she lives, you will have to first remove God from his throne. And that's not going to happen. That's right. That's not going to happen. Well, you have, you've just given a, um, a wonderful foundation for an announcement I'm going to make at the end about our next webinar, which is going to be about Islam. So thank you for that. I'm going to, uh, at the end, I'm going to announce our next webinar. But you've also mentioned the fact that it's a theological uh, struggle. Yeah. Is it? So I want to change um, direction a little bit here, but stay on the theology uh, angle of it and application for Christian lives, because we're about, this is the last question we're about to close. So as we end, I want to ask you a two-part question, because we need to provide encouragement and advice to the Christians that are, who are listening. The entire world has been affected by a, a current environment of fear caused by COVID. We, everyone has been through a lot in the last year plus. Not only is there the fear of COVID, things that have happened, governmental things that have happened because of that, but Christians in particular, I'm finding because my work is completely in the Christian world, Christians are intimidated by some of the resulting limitations on worship. And even in some cases, the closing of churches, I think we've all probably seen the pictures like of the church in Canada, of the authorities actually putting a fence around the church, pastors being arrested because they are trying to exercise their right to assemble and hold services. You've written recently your newsletter about the increase in persecution of Christians that's already here and will continue to increase. So the first part of my question is, Based on your life experience, you, you faced a very real danger as you stood against the evil of apartheid and with what Christians are now facing. Why, this is the first part, why should Christians continue to stand with Israel and the Jewish people no matter what, in spite of whatever we're facing and in spite of increased persecution? And the second part of my question is what can we do? What should American evangelicals in particular do to stand against anti-Semitism which is coming from the far left, the far right, it's all over social media, and it's coming from parts of the Christian world. So why should we keep standing and what do we need to do? Yeah, well, I think, I think first of all, Christians need to stand uh, with Israel, uh, as I've often said, not because of prophecy, but because of promises, that God gave a promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago. And that promise, he gave to Abraham was for the blessing of the world. It wasn't for Israel as an end in herself. And he said, in you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And part of the Abrahamic covenant and its promises is the land of Israel as an everlasting possession, uh, as a springboard to bring the light and the revelation of God to the nations and to bring blessing to the nations. And so the nation of Israel and her modern day restoration stands on very, very firm biblical foundations. And even the New Testament uh, 
write so much about the Abrahamic covenant. The book of Galatians right. actually says that the Abrahamic covenant cannot be annulled. There's no, not one part of it can be annulled. And uh, the book of Hebrews says that uh, we can trust, um, we can trust the God of the Bible today in all aspects as Christian people, because he has kept his promises to the Jewish people in the Abrahamic covenant. And ultimately the Abrahamic covenant is for the blessing of the world. And for the Christian world, from one end of the earth to the other, the great, 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 great grandson of the Jewish people, Jesus of Nazareth, has brought blessing and, and salvation <clears throat> and joy uh, to so many lives. He's done that for my life. He found, my, he found me on a gold mine in Africa <laughs> and changed my life. And so for Christians, I think we stand on the sure, solid, biblical promise that this restoration of Israel is because of God's faithfulness to the Jewish people, which he proclaimed 4,000 years ago. And if God is faithful to that promise, then I put it to every Christian, how dare you not be faithful to it? Mm -hmm. So may God help us to pray for Israel, to stand with Israel. And in matters like we've discussed today, to defend her. In terms of the Christian world, Absolutely. I think, I think Christians must, must arm themselves, first of all. I think if you don't arm yourself and you don't acquaint yourself with what's going on, <clears throat> you will be taken by surprise. Before you know it, you will compromise your faith and give in to the pressure. I grew up in apartheid South Africa. There were many white South Africans who resisted the apartheid government. You must believe me, my own family, many of them. And, uh, <clears throat> but the cost of standing up against it was too much for them. So before they knew it, they were complicit in a system mm -hmm. that overwhelmingly dehumanized million. I mean, 30 million people were effectively ruled in the end by 1.7 million mm -hmm. uh, people. I just said 2 million to round it off, but 1.7 million mm -hmm. ruled over 30 million people. And the, the vast majority of, of white people, actually, in many respects, who were against it, and I knew many of them in the churches everywhere, they just fell in with it because they didn't want to pay the price. And, you know, that's a dangerous place to be in because eventually history will judge you. You know, at least, and I'm not saying this in a bragging way, uh, my children, they knew I grew up in apartheid South Africa. Uh, I mean, 1952, it came in in 1948. I was born in 1952. And I had no excuse for what I witnessed and what I saw. Mm -hmm. And I thank God today that if they ask me, Dad, what did you do? I can say, yeah, I did something. Mm -hmm. I did something. Mm -hmm. And you've got your children as Christians to be responsible to. You better do something. So we have to stand up. And uh, there are many well-known Christians, even in the USA today, who are under pressure and being persecuted. Franklin Graham's one of them. Yes. Mike Pence was one of them. They laughed at him. They scoffed at him. They yeah. persecuted his wife because she taught at a Christian day school. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is unbelievable. Christians have got to find their voices and they have to stand up. And ultimately, they need to know in these difficult times, the Bible says that God is my refuge and my strong tower. So we, ne we have nothing to fear. Because we hide ourselves in the God who loves us and, and cares for us. And he is a strong tower from the enemy. But we have to find our faithfulness and be obedient. And when we stand, he'll help us. I don't know why. I mean, people say, oh, you, you were courageous in what you did. I mean, I, I was hounded by the Bureau of State Security eventually. I was threatened with imprisonment and all of that. But I can't say I did it actually because I got to a point where I saw the contradiction that was taking place between what I saw on the streets and what was in the Bible. And I just knew I had no other option. I mean, I was as scared as you can make me. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had no option other than to stand up for the truth. So we have to stand up for the truth in spite of fear. Yes, that's yes. what I. That was exactly what, where yes. I wanted to get because and, we're all dealing with fear and knowing that God is a tower and a strength yeah. and a, as a refuge. Mm -hmm. He will. He helped me. I mean, he saved my life in the most remarkable way. In that, uh, a man who was from the Bureau of State Security as a plant in my church, 
actually got wonderfully uh, saved. He came to faith under my preaching one night. And he was masquerading as a freelance journalist. Mm -hmm. And he asked to see me in the next week. I mean, he, he had a wonderful encounter with God. And he came to see me and I thought he wanted to talk about his faith. And he came in with a fire like this. He said, I have to repent and tell you who I am. <laughs> and I am from the Bureau of State Security. And you will be arrested and detained without trial. But I will help you. I will give you time to make a plan. Mm -hmm. So God became my refuge and my strength. Mm -hmm. But I had to put my feet out and step into obedience. And then God stepped in. Mm -hmm. Paul and Silas were there in jail. They stepped out in obedience and worshipped God. And their chains fell off and they were taken out. Just like Peter. Mm -hmm. God will help you. You know, you don't need to fear. But you have to be obedient. And God has not called any of us to success. But he's called us to faithfulness. That's right. Thank you. And to take one step at a time and to do what we can do where we are. Exactly. So, you know, it's been said so much now. It's I'm afraid it's almost trivial, but in force, we've been called to this place for such a time as this. We are where we are for such a time as this. Exactly. We have to be responsible to do what we can do where we are. Exactly. This is the time. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Malcolm, this has been a real encouragement, I know, to everyone listening, to camera staff and to uh, all the Christian audience. It's been informative. It's been challenging. It's been encouraging. Your life is a tremendous testimony as to how to do the right thing when you're presented with what needs to be done, yeah. no matter what, no matter what the consequences may be. As Esther said, okay, I'll do it. If I die, I die. And that's where we need to be at this point. Uh, if people want to know more about your work and be able to purchase your books, of, I have them all. I highly recommend them. Where can they find you? They can just go to malcolmheading.com. Okay. It's easy. Malcolmheading.com. All right. My website, okay. everything's on there. Everything. All right. Thank you so much for spending this time with us. It's been a, a wonderful encouragement. And thank you, everyone in the audience, for joining us today. If you want to know more about the work of Cameras Partnership of Christians and Jews, please go to camerspartnership.org. If you'd like to be on our mailing list, the Christian mailing list, please email me at Tricia, T-R-I-C-I-A at camera.org. And if you have any questions, if there's any way we can help you in your stand for Israel and the Jewish people, please feel free to email me at Tricia at camera.org. Our next Partnership of Christians and Jews webinar will be Thursday, June 10th. It'll feature Reverend Mark Dury. Um, he's also a doctor. He's an Australian pastor and academic. Mark writes and speaks on a wide range of topics, including the persecution of religious minorities who live in Muslim majority environments. And when he joins us in June, he's gonna address the ongoing problem of Muslim persecution of Christians and a very troubling issue, which is how some Christians are attempting to align with Islam and find commonality. So we need to address that because that's a serious uh, problem. So save the date for June 10th. Thank you again for joining us and we'll see you in June. God bless you.